Good morning, and welcome to worship at Calvary Presbyterian Church in San Francisco. For 165 years, we have nurtured and inspired our faith community to transform lives for Christ. So no matter who you are, no matter where you are on life's journey, know that you are welcome. And you are more than viewers. You are participants. Worship is not a spectator sport. It is a participatory event. So even though you are viewing today's service via Facebook or YouTube, you can sing with us. You can pray with us. And today, the first Sunday of the month, you can commune with us. The church is not just a building. More importantly, the church is the people wherever you are. And what is so special whenever the church celebrates communion is that you can still celebrate, to, we can still celebrate together, even when we are not physically together. So in preparation, Now's the time to go choose your bread and your cup and be ready when it is time for us to gather around the Lord's table. I am the Reverend Cal Chin, and together with my incredible colleagues, the Reverend Victor Floyd and the Reverend Dr. Joanne Witt, Michael Conley, John Walco, and many others, we are here to serve you. And as you have heard us say over the months, Calvary's financial needs do not decrease just because our church doors are not open for public gatherings. We, the church has remained open and continue to serve our church family and the community. We are now ready to worship. So please join with me and take a deep breath. And as you exhale, listen to these words. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for God is good. God's steadfast love endures forever. Let us worship God. God who gathers us together to worship, welcomes us, nurtures us, blesses us, and forgives us. Please join me in the prayer of confession. Living God, you dwell within us even when we aren't paying attention. Sometimes when we open ourselves to you, we fear we may be talking to ourselves. At those times, help us remember the humbling trust of children 
how our bodies heal themselves, the miracles of sight and breath, sunrise and love, so that the core of our confidence is our faith in you. Let us be still and know that you are God. Amen. Friends, hear the good news of God's grace. God is ready to help us when we are ready to be helped. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are all forgiven. And now may the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. And also with you. Let us exchange a symbol, an emoji, or a word of peace. we want to have a sign from God. We want to know that God is there. How do we know that God is there? I'm sure you have very different ways of knowing when you feel God's presence. Sometimes when we take a walk, we feel God's presence. Sometimes we're with our friends or our family and we feel love. Or we're by ourselves and we feel peaceful. So let's hear a Bible story today that talks about a sign that God is there with Rebecca. So here's a picture. This is from a book called Growing in God's Love, Elizabeth Caldwell and Friends. And here is a picture. So what do you see in that picture? Just taking a moment to notice some of the colors and there might be some animals. What are they doing? Okay, I'm going to go ahead and read the story. How do you welcome guests to your home? Do you invite them to sit down? Do you offer something to drink or eat? Listen for how Rebecca and her family welcomed a stranger. Rebecca lived with her family in a city. Each night before dinner, it was her job to get water from the city well. And if you can remember the picture, there were some jars and that is where they stored water. She carried her big water jar on her shoulders. After she filled her jar with water, she saw a stranger praying to God. The man looked up from his prayer and saw Rebecca. Please, he asked, may I have a sip of your water? Of course, said Rebecca kindly, drink all you want and I will go and get water for your camels too. Well, that's very generous. Rebecca ran back to the well. She filled her jar again and again until every animal had water. Then Rebecca invited the stranger to join her family for dinner. That is so kind, especially when they are in a location like this. Looks like a desert or a place that is very warm and hot. Before they ate, the man said, I have something amazing to tell you. I work for a man named Abraham. He is part of your family. Abraham and his wife, Sarah, followed God far from here. When they were very old, they had a baby named Isaac. Now Isaac is all grown up. Abraham sent me here to find someone for Isaac to marry. I was asking for God's help at the well. That's when I saw Rebecca. I know that she is the one for Isaac. Rebecca's family thought about how far away Rebecca would be if she agreed to marry Isaac. But Rebecca's family felt God tugging on their hearts. So this is a moment when they're not seeing God, but they're feeling God. Is there a time in your life or in your day when you feel God tugging at your heart? They agreed that God was calling Rebecca. The man begged the family to send Rebecca with him the very next day. Rebecca's family said, this is a big decision and only Rebecca can decide. So they called Rebecca and asked her, do you want to go with this man? 
do you want to marry Isaac? I think that's very kind that they asked her what she wanted to do. Rebecca thought about the journey she would take. Rebecca wondered what this man called Isaac was like. But Rebecca felt God tugging at her heart. She said, yes, I will go. Early the next morning, Rebecca began her long journey to her new home. She was riding a camel when she saw a man walking in the fields. Who is that man? She asked. That man is Isaac. That man who worked for Abraham introduced Rebecca to Isaac. Then he told Isaac everything that had happened. Isaac married Rebecca and he loved her. Rebecca was glad God had tugged on her heart. She loved Isaac. They comforted each other when they were sad. They cared for each other as they grew old. How does God talk to us without using words? How did Rebecca's family welcome the man who worked for Abraham? Talk with your family about inviting someone to eat with you. I know that's a little bit difficult right now, but you can do it on Zoom. Or sometimes people are social distancing with masks at a park and they're six feet apart. What will you need to do to get ready for your guests? Thank you for listening to this story. And I hope that you are connecting to how God is tugging at your heart this week.
A reading from Genesis, chapter 24, verse 34, 36 through 38, and 42 through 48. So he said, I am Abraham's servant. And Sarah, my master's wife, bore a son to my master when she was old, and he has given him all that he has. My master made me swear, saying, You shall not take a wife for my son from the daughters of the Canaanites, in whose land I live, but you shall go to my father's house, to my kindred, and get a wife for my son. I came today to the spring and said, O Lord, the God of my master Abraham, if now you will only make successful the way I am going, I am standing here by the spring of water. Let the young woman who comes out to draw, to whom I shall say, Please give me a little water from your jar to drink, and who will say to me, Drink, and I will draw for your camels also. Let her be the woman whom the Lord has appointed for my master's son. Before I had finished speaking in my heart, there was Rebekah coming out with her water jar on her shoulder, and she went down to the spring and drew. I said to her, Please let me drink. She quickly let down her jar from her shoulder and said, Drink, and I will also water your camels. So I drank, and she also watered the camels. Then I asked her, Whose daughter are you? She said, The daughter of Bethuel, Nahor's son, whom Milcah bore to him. So I put the ring on her nose and the bracelets on her arms. Then I bowed my head and worshipped the Lord and blessed the Lord, the God of my master Abraham, who led me by the right way to obtain the daughter of my master's kinsman for his son. The Word of the Lord. The ancient stories about Abraham and his descendants are what author Dave Steele called BIF stories, before the invention of fact. There may have been an Abraham, a Sarah, and an Isaac, but we know how stories change with the telling over centuries. On the 4th of July weekend, we might recall George Washington and the cherry tree. George Washington, of course, was a real historical person, and there's evidence that he was highly honest. But the cherry tree story was invented by Parson Weems, an 18th century biographer, we pass down such stories in our own families, too. My great-great-grandparents were 49ers. That's a fact we can document. The story is that my great-great-grandmother made more money selling pies to the miners than her husband did panning for gold. It's a good story. Is it true? It certainly tells a truth. My grandfather did not strike it rich. And the miners did pay astronomical prices for luxury goods like homemade pies. Many Old Testament stories tell that kind of truth. They tell truths about life and about a people's relationship with God, and as all good stories do, about ourselves. For example, sometimes what we really want is a sign. We're in crisis unsure what's to come, and we want a sign. When I have to make a tough decision, when I have to let go of something in order to embrace something else, I want a sign. I want a sign from God. Just a little message will do, saying, this path, not that one, but not so subtle that I don't see it. The Bible reinforces this desire. It's full of stories in which people get dramatic and concrete signs. God speaks right out loud to some people. God promised Abraham that his offspring would outnumber the stars. In their old age, Abraham and Sarah finally have a son, Isaac. So maybe God's promise will be fulfilled after all. But first, Isaac needs a wife. Like so many immigrants before and since, 
Abraham sends for a bride from the old country. He dispatches his servant to Haran with loads of camels and gifts to grease the skids. He assures the servant that God will point the way. The servant arrives in town when it's time for the women to come to the well. Unmarried women generally didn't leave the house except to draw water, so wells functioned as kind of a singles bar in the ancient villages. The servant prays for a sign. Let the young woman who not only offers him water, but offers water to his camels as well, be the wife appointed by God for Isaac. Rebecca shows up looking lovely and available, and things go just as the servant has prayed. He drapes her with gold jewelry to show his master's wealth and serious intentions. In our passage, the servant is retelling this story to Rebecca's family. In earlier verses, he asks Rebecca who her family is and whether they have room for a house guest. This isn't an unusual request because there were few inns, but he's also trying to figure out if her family is prosperous enough for Isaac. She invites him over, and that clinches it. He falls down to the ground to worship God because he knows he's found Isaac's bride. While later verses tell us nothing is final until Rebecca herself agrees to the arrangement, Rebecca, the passage says, is the wife God has appointed for Isaac. A definite plan, a destiny, if you will. Is that how God works? Does God choose a partner for us? Does God have a career path in mind for us? Does every life choice we face have one right answer and all we have to do is follow the signs? Pentecost was a few weeks ago, a day that we celebrate that God has not left us on our own. Through the Holy Spirit, God offers to lead us and guide us and give us direction. However, in my experience, that guidance, that direction, is rarely as unambiguous as in this story. So our challenge is to figure out when and how God is giving us guidance and how we can trust that it is God. First, if we don't expect God's help, we won't notice it. God communicates with us through people, events, our intuitions, prayer, scripture, and life around us. But if you aren't listening for it or looking for it, you won't see it or hear it. Frederick Beekner writes that once during the time of his daughter's battle with anorexia, he saw a car coming out of nowhere with a license plate that bore on it the one word out of all the words in the dictionary that he needed most to see exactly then. The word was trust. Was it God? Was it coincidence? Beekner says, maybe both. It definitely helped him, but he had to be willing to believe God might be trying to say something to him. How do we tell whether God is speaking to us through a license plate or whether we're just reading into it what we want to hear? We have good reason to be cautious about claiming God's guidance too casually. So how do we know what God wants for us What's a sign? What isn't a sign? One way to think about it is that God's purpose in guiding us is to help us make decisions that are faithful, not preordained, not our fate, but faithful. These faithful decisions start with paying attention to who God is and what God wants for God's world. We might ask ourselves, is the decision we're considering more likely to produce acts of kindness and compassion or indifference? Generosity toward others or selfishness? Justice or inequity? 
truth, or deception, respect for others and the natural world, or contempt, forgiveness, or judgment, hope, or cynicism. In this lovely story about Rebecca at the well, the servant noticed that Rebecca was generous, hospitable, and knew her own mind. Excellent qualities in a spouse. He constructed a test that would show whether a young woman had those qualities, if she offered him water and offered water to his camels. You might be sitting there thinking, well, that's not rocket science. And that's the point. God's guidance isn't rocket science. God's signs are the ones that point us to truth, kindness, generosity, healing, justice, freedom, faith, hope, and love. In other words, to shalom and warn us away from their opposites. Whitaker Chambers was an American journalist, a former communist spy, and an embittered atheist. But one day, as he watched his baby daughter drool over the tray of her high chair, he found himself staring with fascination at her tiny, intricate ear. It seemed to him a marvel, a sign. Only a planner could have planned that ear. This sign set Chambers on the road to belief. A baby's ear, a kind young woman at a well, a license plate, an upbeat song on the radio just when you needed extra courage, the offhand comment of a friend that, hey, you're, you're really good at this. Signs that point us in the right direction or remind us who we are or who God is. But there are also signs that something needs to change. And these signs aren't usually as charming as a baby's ear. They may be uncomfortable, painful even, or frightening. The knot in your stomach that tells you something is very wrong. The last straw that tells you it's time to leave an abusive relationship. The mess you've made of your life that says it's time to go to a 12-step meeting. Or the rude awakening that if you never heard of Juneteenth or the Tulsa race massacre until recently, maybe there are other things you don't know about being black in America. And then there is this sign, this table, and the bread and the cup, signs of our bonding to Jesus, to his life, and his message, signs that we are rooted in doing what Jesus did, and that this adds a sacramental dimension, a holiness to our everyday lives that can shape how we live Christ's message of love. Signs, they are all around us, my friends, sometimes whispering, sometimes shouting, occasionally knocking us upside the head, God is always calling us, pointing us to shalom. God speaks to us through our very lives. And if we listen, the Holy Spirit really does give us abundant guidance. May it be so for you and for me. Amen. Hello, Calvary. Michael Conley here, Director of Music Ministries, and I'm coming to you today with a kind of sad announcement. Our beloved Phoebe Rosquist uh, is moving. In fact, she has already moved to Burbank, to Southern California. Um, her husband, Nathan, her, the company that he works for because of the pandemic, closed their Bay Area offices, um, but he was offered a job with the company uh, in Southern California. So we are happy for him and happy for them that they will continue to have employment in these uncertain times, um, but very sad for us that it means that physically Phoebe and Nathan are moving away. Because we're still recording our services online every week, 
uh, Phoebe is going to continue to sing and she'll make recordings and send them in every week from Southern California. But when the time comes for us to move back into the sanctuary and to start doing live music again, um, we will unfortunately have to replace Phoebe. There's no replacing Phoebe, but we will find another wonderful soprano uh, who will um, lead our section and be our soprano soloist. Um, I am personally so uh, enormously grateful for the privilege of getting to know Phoebe and to work with her, to have her as a colleague, to know her as a human being, to share the altar with her, making music week in and week out. And she's just a lovely person. We've been so fortunate to have her as part of the music staff here uh, and part of our worship experiences week in and week out. And she's just going to be missed so very much. When the time comes um, and we can all uh, be together in the same room, then we will have a proper farewell celebration for Phoebe and a moment of thanksgiving for all the wonderful things that she's brought to Calvary. But in the meantime, I just wanted you all to know that she has moved um, and to wish her well and to say thanks for the gift that she has been to this community. Thank you, Phoebe. We love you.
Our church community this morning is scattered in many kitchens and living rooms. Yet we are one bread, one cup of blessing, one body. There is no lockdown on God's blessing and no quarantine on grace. The Lord's table is everyone's table and Christ meets you at your table. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. Holy God, our loving creator, close to us as breathing and distant as the farthest star, we thank you for your constant love for all you have made. We thank you for all that sustains life and for all people of faith of every generation who strive to know your will, and especially for Jesus Christ. He cared for all, forgiving their failures, healing their hurts, and nurturing their faith. He displayed in his life, death, and rising again the power of your spirit. Gracious God, pour out your Holy Spirit upon us and upon these gifts of the bread and the cup that the bread we break and the cup we bless may be the communion of the body and blood of Christ. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, that we may be one with all who share this feast. As this bread is Christ's body for us, send us out to be the body of Christ in the world. Holy God, we enter this time of prayer mindful of our inability to be content. We are restless and dissatisfied even when we have all we need and then some. Instead of giving thanks for that which we have, we lament that which we feel we lack. We burn ourselves with things that do not offer that which they promise. We burn others with expectations they cannot possibly meet. We burn creation with our relentless abuse of the earth and its creatures as we pause to acknowledge our total dependence on you. Reveal to us the abundance of you pour out upon your people. We celebrate the goodness you embed in humanity. We look for the helpers, the healers, the teachers, mentors, leaders, and encouragers who spend their lives looking to the interests of others seeking to serve rather than to be served. We give thanks for those closest to us, the people who love us at our worst, cheer us when we are at our lowest, care for us when we are at our weakest and want for us what is best. They show us what it means to be called beloved and significant. We lament the suffering so pervasive in our world. We cry out to you with sighs too deep for words, for those who go to bed hungry, the people fearing for their lives, the vulnerable too long exploited, and your children lonely and the impoverished. As we are yoked to Christ, yoke us to those who need their burden lightened and their souls refreshed. We make our prayer in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who taught us to say when we pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. The Lord Jesus, on the night of his arrest, took bread. He blessed it and he broke it and gave it to his disciples saying take 
eat. This is my body, broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, he took the cup and giving thanks, he raised it saying, this is my love poured out for you, my lifeblood, all that I have, I pour out for you. Drink this cup and remember me and remember what I taught you. Please join me in prayer. Loving God, we thank you that you have fed us in the sacrament and united us with Christ. Now send us out by the power of your Holy Spirit to live and work as signs of your love and that we might recognize you in others. Amen. Calvary's financial needs do not decrease because our doors are not open for public gatherings. The church has remained open, continuing to serve our church family and our community. And so since we are not able to pass the offering plate, we ask you to donate online. A link is available in the comments section or at calpres.org. And of course, there is a big make a donation button in the online bulletin for your convenience. We will now receive our offering.
Thank you for worshiping with us at Calvary Presbyterian Church. Uh, please join us again next Sunday on YouTube or Facebook. Today we have a very special benediction. Our soprano soloist Phoebe is moving to Los Angeles and we're celebrating with a sung benediction. Don't forget to sign up for a virtual coffee hour. You can register on the Calvary website and then expect an email from your host telling you how to enter the Zoom a virtual coffee hour. Next Sunday, July 12th, is the Reverend Cal Chin's last Sunday with Calvary. He's been the transitional head of staff here at Calvary for about a year and a half, and it has been a wonderful journey with Cal. Please join us for worship next week so that you can say goodbye to him.